guys. Good afternoon. I'm Paul from Lucid View. Uh, obviously, you heard from my colleague earlier on today, and he gave you a very nice presentation uh, from a sales pitch kind of perspective. Um, I'm more of a technical person at Lucid View. I'm a propeller head. I like to solve problems. So I think my presentation is going to be more uh, in terms of I'm actually going to look at two case studies of problems that I've had with clients in the past and how I solve it. And I'm actually hoping that you'll commiserate with me because I suspect once you see the problem I'm describing, um, you would recognize these problems that you've seen or that I'm going to demonstrate now. So we're going to talk about behavior-based IDS. Um, we correctly assumed intrusion detection system and it's looking at behavior of traffic at your organization um, and then based on that, identifying anomalous behavior. Now, uh, I'm committing a cardinal sin of presentations. Um, I have too many slides, so I'll try to go through them uh, relatively quickly uh, and just focus on the important bits so you get an idea uh, of what we're talking about before your eyes glaze over. Um, so I'm going to cover who we are, uh, but that's mostly been covered. Uh, the problem and then talk about malware and persistent connections and a specific malware instance that we encountered at a client. Um, and then LucidView made for MicroTik, how we combat this, and then our LucidView portal. But a lot of what I'm discussing now is not just applicable to our LucidView portal and our mechanism of handling this problem. It can be handled by your own systems if you like. Um, it is just one of the mechanisms I use to solve this problem. Now, we've touched on who we are. Um, now, we don't just block porn. We were born out of a need for visibility. Now, we, s we started out uh, doing bandwidth monitoring for our clients because there was a big disconnect between management and visibility. And we came up with a slogan that said, you can't manage what you can't see. And we apply that even to today. Uh, the big thing about networks is you need visibility on what's going through before you can try and make decisions as to how to solve any problems. As soon as you have visibility, you can find a way to manage that traffic. So that's pretty much what we are. We're about visibility and we're about management once you know what's actually going on. So um, porn is one category, but uh, there's lots of other things to look at as well. You need to know what's going on in your network. Um, now, I have a slide with impressive looking statistics. Um, it will uh, impress you hopefully. 95% um, of breaches could have been presented uh, and just as a side note, uh, my slides, uh, I'll send them to, uh, to the MUM organizers. Uh, the presenter's notes will have some of the links to these statistics uh, if you're interested. Uh, so 95% of breaches could have been prevented, uh, which means uh, most of them could have been eliminated. 3.2% uh, decrease in reported breach incidents. Um, I don't know why that's important. 3.2% doesn't sound statistically relevant. Um, 5 billion records exposed, that's relevant. Uh, there's a big lawsuit going on with Yahoo at the moment uh, because customers' uh, data were ex was exposed and uh, subsequently these people got exposed to uh, all kinds of problems, financial losses and so on. Uh, Eight billion dollars financial impact. Unfortunately, we don't have South African useful statistics. Um, and then 12% rise in business targeted ransomware from Symantec and $12.5 billion dollars in business, uh, email account uh, breaches or compromises, uh, which is significant. Um, and obviously, we have some recent examples in South Africa. City Power, 2019. Um, they received the following ransom note. Um, this is in October when they got hit the second time last year. We have dozens of backdoors inside your city. We have control of everything in your city. We also compromised all passwords and sensitive data, such as finance and personal population information. That's what the ransom note said. Give us many bitcoins and the problem will go away. Now, obviously, this is an exaggeration, but as soon as someone has breached your network and they give you one little thing about the network, all of a sudden it seems very legitimate and worrisome. Liberty was to uh, targeted lo uh, last year as well. Um, and then obviously WannaCry was the top ransomware of 2019. Uh, so it's a big issue. Um, and we'll see uh, why it's a big issue and the, uh, the, uh, why we are the kind of last defense uh, for a lot of these clients. Um, and in the first case I'm going to talk about, this is a client, I will not name any clients. Um, we'll just talk about the problems experience and you can commiserate with me because uh, 
they, there's not always a happy ending. Um, so the client complain, slow internet, slow services. They host applications on their, uh, on, in their data center, um, so the services were slow. Dropped connections, queued emails, and sometimes mail servers not accepting emails. Um, that's a huge problem, and you probably all have had this before. My internet's slow, you broke it, you fix it. Um, that's usually the kind of response that you get from these guys. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is it's not always as cut and dry. It's not a question of increasing bandwidth if internet slow. There might be many other reasons for that, and we'll see that now. So we started drilling into the data for this client. This one was relatively simple. Um, so there you can see a graph, and it's got lots of spikes, so it's very impressive. Um, it's called suspicious. Um, now, uh, I'll show you some of our other graphs, and this is all uh, data that's been interpreted by our portal, but there's many ways uh, of interpreting this data. This is the way we represent it for ourselves and our clients. Um, and obviously suspicious, well, it's suspicious. Um, and so we looked at what is the destination for suspicious, this specific instance, and there was one interesting destination. Now, notice it says connection count. Uh, you'll see there's 2.5. That means it's a persistent connection from the organization to that specific IP address. It happened to be in Russia, which is doubly suspicious. So no offense to any Russians if there are any Russians. And for, for the same graph, obviously you can see it's the same graph over and over. And uh, this, is the IP, this is the actual IP address. I left it in there because uh, 192.168 is innocuous enough. I'm not going to give away any confidential information. So this is the actual host on the network that was connecting to Russia persistently. And uh, we're looking at uh, 23 July to 28 July, but this, th this had been going on for quite a while, and it's a problem. So we looked up what is that IP address, and uh, you can find the source for this information. There's a link in the, in the notes, uh, presentation notes. Uh, you can see lots of other organizations agree with us. It's suspicious. Um, so there's as a honeypot attack and brute forcing on port 3389, there's lots of weird things happening on this IP address. But the fact of the matter is, if your host, your server inside your network has a persistent connection to somewhere else on the outside of the internet, that is very suspicious. Um, it should never happen because you, you know where your server is connecting to. Um, so uh, obviously we alerted the client to this problem. No, there's nothing wrong with the, the server. So. We kept on insisting they must have a look at this. It turns out what was happening at this client, the malware-infected host was on a VMware server. Um, so this was actually their mail server at this site. And the malware was on the mail server talking back to Russia. Now, um, the first problem is your mail server should be up to date and patched and protected and all that kind of stuff. So that's an issue in itself. But what was happening is uh, this server was actually used as a point of infection uh, out to the internet. Um, so it was using all CPU it can find and obviously as much RAM as was available and this whole VMware server was slowing down because of this. So usually when a client says internet is slow, it's not necessarily the internet that, that's the problem. It could be something like this. And this infected host was using all the resources because it was infected by the Wanna, WannaCry ransomware Crypto Worm, which is a bit of a problem. As you, as you saw in my uh, previous slides, uh, it was rated as 2019's worst Crypto Worm. So we alerted the client, um, no, can't be. And eventually, after a couple of weeks, the host went down completely. Uh, they had other services that were compromised. They went down as well, had to rebuild them all. And eventually, we had three service providers in the same room with the client and had to convince them and only when all three service providers collectively said, wanna cry, you're infected, was the problem solved. But by that time, mail server had fallen over and a number of services had fallen over. But the key thing here is visibility is very important. And uh, the people sitting in this room working with all the Microjig tools, uh, you are the kind of people that can give the visibility to your client. Now, uh, just an interesting side note about WannaCry. Uh, I just find it ironic. Uh, it propagates through Eternal Blue, an exploit developed by the United States National Security Agency. And now it's really affecting them negatively as well. It's just ironic. All right, so the options available, and the first one that I've got in bold 
Uh, it's in bold because it's important. Um, visibility is identifying the problem, and there, root or OS is very useful. Um, without a tool that allows you to uh, do something with that data, uh, you're not going to have any visibility. And fortunately, the root OS is very, very conveniently has built in NetFlow capability, as you can see over here. I think a lot of you have already done this before. Um, now, that was the first thing that we used, um, is pumping all this NetFlow data to our cloud. Um, so, send NetFlow to us. But the second thing is, we also send all the DNS logs to us. Now, I don't know if any of you have played with the syslogging on RootOS yet. Um, this, is, this is a very simple configuration. It's just two lines, and you set up a remote syslog target, and this is the important part. You tell it, just send us the topics DNS, but not anything about the packets. We just want to see the DNS, and this simple little line sends syslog data to any syslog server that you've got, uh, whether it's just a little Linux Ubuntu server somewhere or something else. And it's nice and clear text format. You can import it into your own database to look at it. It gives you a query, gives you a response, if there is a response. And, uh, but the question is, what do you do with this information? Uh, because I made a small little mistake, and it took me a while to figure this out, why I wasn't seeing the problem. And you'll see this in the second case. Um, if you look at case two, malware mechanism. Now, this one is actu actually the one that got me the most excited last year. Uh, not everybody will find this interesting, but I find it fascinating. Um, so once again, the complaint, and once, uh, once again, all of you have heard this complaint before, my internet is slow. Now, this is a relatively large client. We have um, many gigabit internet breakout, um, and I think we have about 50 or 60,000 hosts behind it. And they were complaining that the internet is slow. But from the internet breakout, we tested, and there's nothing wrong with the internet. So obviously, they say, increase the bandwidth, throttle Facebook, uh, do something. But it's not an internet bandwidth problem. Once again, there's something else going on, broken internet connections. Emails are que queuing, or at times, not even being accepted. What is the problem? And uh, obviously, I'm talking about the mail servers not accepting the emails. So what is the issue? It's not bandwidth. We started drilling in. And this is where, um, if you look at this one, I don't know if anybody, uh, most of you have done TCP dumps before in the past. Um, now, previous, uh, what I was doing, I was sending all the syslog data to uh, our cloud portal if there's a nice re response. But notice this TCP dump that I've got here. Uh, you can see there is a query for the A record. V1 dot, I'm not going to try and pronounce that. Um, and then you'll see there's a response, but there's no actual IP address, A record, or anything associated uh, with this. There's just a query for an A record, and there's just no, um, no DNS entry for this. And you can see there's another one, m22findu.com, something like that. Um, so, and this keeps on happening over and over and over, and you can see there's lots of them, there's no DNS record. So what was happening is the DNS servers were being denial of service by this. Um, and I didn't see this because I wasn't uploading blank responses. I was only uploading when I get a valid IP address. Because if you do a domain resolution, what's the point in having it in the report if I don't have data to associate with that IP address? So I just ignored it, which was a problem, um, which is why I needed to resort to TCP dump. Um, now, so another view of this, uh, you will notice the domain component. Uh, I filtered by Russian. Nothing against Russians. I'm really sorry. Uh, I just realized now I uh, keep on hammering about Russians. There's an, a .ru domain. We'll see Russia again later. Um, it just so happens in this example. Um, so you'll see the domain itself is consistent, but the host is different every single time. And I'm looking at connections now. This is now after I realized my mistake and started uploading um, the blank DNS records as well. And all of a sudden, there's lots of attempts. And this is just for that one domain I just filtered for interest sake. And so we decided to develop a dashboard for this. And you can see very interesting records over here. It, once again, this one, sorry, Russians, also just .ru. Um, I, I think we did this to drive home the importance of the problem, uh, because Russia is always topical when it comes to this and Trump and all that. So you can see there's lots of host counts, 548 for the top line, 7,506 queries um, to these specific domains, and uh, obviously there's pages and pages of this stuff. Uh, this is the five-minute 
result that we had at, at the client. You can see we can go to a 60-minute report as well. But this is every five minutes this hits their DNS servers. And the Active Directories could not keep up. Uh, obviously, they forward to us, but they co couldn't resolve this stuff fast enough or fail to resolve them fast enough, and internet slowed down subsequently. And you can't send email if you can't do DNS resolution. You cannot receive email if you cannot do DNS resolution properly. And that's where the source of the problem came from. So DNS resolution of random hosts, uh, so it appears. The hosts do not resolve, or so it seems. And it's a, for, for all intents and purposes, it looks like a denial of service on DNS at this client because the active directories and the local DNS servers, their little routers um, couldn't resolve the DNS. Um, obviously, this is lots of offices going through a single breakout. So it was a huge issue for these guys. And if we analyze the action of this, uh, if you look at the domains, you'll notice there's a little bit of a pattern. If you look at the top one, um, it's a letter and a single number and a period. And then there's seven letters, a period, and it, so it would appear at random top-level domain. So .org.com.cc doesn't really matter, anything like that. And in the second line, you'll see it's a letter once again and two numbers. And this is the, the pattern that kept on repeating over and over and over. And unfortunately, I didn't copy my regular expression into this. It's just a nice short little regular expression that matches this perfectly every single time. And we go in further. So I did a li little bit more research. And um, if we can come back to malware, I'm going to do a brief history of malware. Malware consists of two parties. You've got the infected host, the sucker who's going to be ransomed. And you have command and control, which is usually also an infected host, which is used to by the hacker to gain entry into your organization. Command and control is the way the infected host talk back, talks back home. Because this hacker sitting, uh, let's use a different country, let's say a US rather than Russia. Um, he sits in the United States and he's not gonna connect from his PC to your infected host because then the FBI will knock on his door. So he infects another host and uses that host as an entry point into all the other networks. But um, if you have an infected host, you just see, oh, it's connecting to this. Before I sanitize the PC, if I can't take it offline immediately, let's at least just block the IP. Problem solved, right? Um, so they got more clever and they said, okay, let's hack um, some, uh, some registrar or somebody's account at the registrar, register a DNS name, and then you connect on DNS. If you block the IP, I'll just assign another IP to the DNS. Very easy. Now, how do you block that? Well, then you poison DNS. That's also very simple. Um, so once again, the hackers were thwarted, but the hackers are very smart, much smarter than the rest of us. And they came up with a very nice and clever idea. They don't use hard-coded IPs. They don't use dedicated DNS names. They use a domain generation algorithm. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this before. It's a very clever way of using pseudo-random numbers to generate a sequence of domains um, in order for this infected host to talk back home to. Now, the, the infected host has an infected malware or worm or something, or, or encrypted malware or worm on it. So for me to just look at that code, I can't see what host it will be connecting to uh, because it's all encrypted. The only thing I can do is look at the behavior, look at the IP addresses, the domains and so on. But in this case, we had literally millions of domains happening uh, all at once. And how do you defend against that? The IPs keep changing, I block it um, on the firewall. And then if I look again 10 minutes later, it's picked another IP address. Because what is happening now is a pseudo random number generator generates the sequence on the worm of, of domains. Uh, now if I just go back up quickly, if you look at this uh, domain over here, in this case, we've got v1.ciy and, and the rest. The actual host component turned out to be irrelevant. It's a decoy. Uh, security through obscurity, that kind of thing. Um, so the actual component that was important here is the, the domain itself, ciyzjlin.org, and obviously it would randomly generate a sequence of the seven-letter domain with a top-level um, domain as well, and it would talk back home like that. If you um, see the DNS entry and you poison it, it would just move on to the next in the sequence, and it would keep on trying, 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 till it finds one that the hacker 
has also registered using a compromised account. And it might have 10 of them, it could have 100 of them. Uh, in this case, we found about 30 IP addresses uh, and 30 hosts, actually many more hosts, but um, all pointing to a couple of infected IP addresses. Now I'll get back to the previous slide. So if you look at this graphic, I stole this from another, uh, another website. You can see I gave credit there at the bottom. So don't be angry. Hackersterminal.com, very nice site. Uh, so they had a very nice graphic of how this works. So at the bottom left, you can see there's the malware infected host. And it uh, doesn't matter how the malware got there. You took your laptop home, uh, it's an insecure network or something. It, it, it can happen many ways. Somebody walks into the organization with a cell phone, USB infected stick, you, you clicked on the wrong email. Uh, I'm not judging you. Um, it got onto the network somehow. Um, there's command and control. And what happens is, uh, sorry, let's go back. So command and control has the same seed for the pseudo random number generator and the infected host has that same seed. Um, it could be complex, they could ha use a, the current date as part of the seed or they could just use a static seed, uh, but that actually makes it more difficult or easier to uh, figure this thing out. And you can see it makes a DNS query. And uh, this one is slightly different. You can see the form of this. There's many different forms of this malware. Um, this is a, well, it's more than seven digits. I'm not going to try and count them. Uh, seven letters and digits, dot net. And DNS server responds, nah, nothing. Tries the next one, DNS server response, nah, nothing. Uh, next one, DNS response, nah, nothing. And then by the fourth try, you can see F536 and the rest, DNS server comes back and says, ah, command and control is 76.166, 122.25, and this infected host can then talk back to command and control. Now, as I said, the hacker then talks back to his infected command and control host, and usually this, these are web servers on the internet. Uh, it's easy for them to connect to it, but it's not necessarily the case. It could be um, an ADSL infected uh, workstation that was exposed to the internet, that kind of thing. And because he knows the seed and he knows the sequence that this thing will go through, he just needs to pick, uh, typically not manually, but he'll have an algorithm that does that automatically. And then this thing can talk back. And now once this hacker has established this connection, just as in the case of my previous client, once he has that connection, it's a persistent connection. And now we're not looking at just the DNS uh, that gives it away. Uh, we are looking at the persistent connection. Now the reason we saw all this DNS activity is because we were blocking suspicious things. So command and control would talk back home. We'd say, hey, wait a minute, this is suspicious. You're talking to, uh, okay, once again, not Russia, Bolivia. Let's pick Bolivia. You're talking to Bolivia with a persistent connection. We don't like it. Block it. And um, based on the behavior, a portal would block this, and then it, it would just try scanning again and again and again. And if you have lots of infected hosts, what happens if a lot of them uh, start scanning or trying to do DNS resolution? We're talking about every host was doing hundreds of resolutions per second, or at least as fast as the DNS service would accept them. Then you have a denial of service unintentionally. Uh, that was not the hacker's intent. He likes to steal money, not uh, necessarily create havoc. Um, but then again, the client's network went down because of this. So now the real work actually begins by the security team. And they need to start digging into this. Coincidentally, the domain generation algorithms, you might see them uh, on your DNS. Uh, some browsers do use this mechanism sometimes. And content delivery networks also use this at times. Uh, for various reasons, and even researchers use them. So DGAs aren't necessarily evil, um, just many times they are. All right, so um, just some quotes from uh, the information that uh, about the, these malware. Beyond magic numbers, magic strings, or magic domain names, also used for generating DJ domains. Um, currently, there are not many effective methods to detect these seeds beyond reverse engineering the binary. Now. It's difficult to reverse engineer these things, but based on the behavior, you can easily see it. Uh, and we'll talk about that just now. The security researchers, researchers found a new malware called Mylobot, and that's exactly the one that we detected at this client. If you correlate our IP addresses, the domains that we noticed, um, a number of these domains and IP addresses were static. Um, they didn't change much because um, there were connections coming back home, and we didn't see it from just this one client. Once we spotted this, we found this at a number of our clients and could alert them to this. And 
Now, even though this malware is called MyLabot, MyLabot is not just MyLabot, different variants of it comes out. It's the same thing, they just find ways of obfuscating um, th this uh, malware. It hides itself from your antivirus and malware scanners and so on. So based on behavior, it's very important to try and pick them up. Um, so Trend Micro picked it up, and it features sophisticated evasion, affection, and propagation techniques. Um, and then, obviously, this is the important part. Um, the malware allows the attacker to gain full control of infected machine, enabling to them to add payloads for other purposes, such as banking trojans, uh, which is bad, um, key loggers, and distributed denial of service. Now, um, I'm pretty sure a similar kind of thing is what happened at City, uh, City Power, and uh, fortunately, our clients that we spotted this at, they haven't been hit by any of this because we are actively busy blocking this. But the problem is once you have so many infected hosts, is sanitizing them. So anyway, the next step is obviously we have visibility. We have identified the problem in both of these cases, and the action is uh, to limit the actions of the infected host. Now, if it's one data center with 10 machines, you can go to the one, yank the cable out. Uh, if you are a service provider to a service provider who provides service to other people, it's more difficult to do this. Um, so the first step is you need to limit the action of the infected host. So once again, DNS filtering by itself, by just poisoning DNS, is difficult because these domains keep on updating. Uh, but based on the behavior of this, we have generated an algorithm that automatically poisons this DNS uh, for you. But the second step is once this host is forked back home to command the control, you need to block it as well. But once again, um, as long as you have visibility, whether you use whatever tool you use to analyze your NetFlow and DNS logs, as soon as you can see this traffic, you can act on it. And that's where the marketing comes in, because you can see this stuff. So you limit the interaction of the infected host. First step is, actually, I've got my order wrong. Block DNS, that's the first step. And the second step is firewalling the IP addresses. And at times, you might have to firewall the host itself from communicating to the internet. And the third step, which is the most important, is sanitize the infected host. Uh, but in the case of our, the second case I was talking about, the reason we are the first line of defense is it took a month for the antivirus and malware updates to come out before they could see this malware infection on the hosts. Up until that point, the security team said, no, there's no infection. So we, sh you showed the, we showed them the dashboard. Like, no, there's the infection, I can see it. Nope. They've scanned the machine, there's no infection, walked away. So in the case of the first client, they lost uh, a number of hosts because they refused to see the infection. Um, but fortunately, they, were not, they didn't lose any money. In the case of the second host, um, they are taking action, obviously, to, or in the second example, they were taking action to solve this problem. Now, um, this is where my product punch comes in. Um, so Lucidview, you'll notice, if you go to Microtech's website, we are made for Microtech. We actually developed this product specifically for Microtech. Um, and the idea is you put these scripts on your Microtech and we analyze the logs. So you can analyze logs whichever way you like, but we like it if you use our system. And the reason we like it if you use our system, we collect and combine the logs from all our clients. And the combined effect of this is uh, everybody benefits from the same data and you don't necessarily have to to a paid for service with us, you can just get this visibility. First step, DNS blocking, second step, and lastly, uh, firewall-based blocking, uh, which is very effective. And obviously, for uh, we have clients in the intelligence community. Uh, I can't mention specific ones. We have nice code names for them. It sounds very impressive, uh, but I'm not allowed to use them. Uh, so these guys, uh, they don't like sending us data. And I think some of you might feel the same way because it's a, a security issue for them. So we do offer the option for people to contact us if you want to use our database um, to populate your systems with more meaningful data. So for example, uh, you might have a list, uh, you might want to generate your own NetFlow logs. Um, you can send us a list of IP addresses, destinations that you are uncertain about. Uh, with our API, we can tell you about those IP addresses. What kind of traffic is it? Does it look suspicious to us? Is it malware? So um, there's uh, interesting uh, work that we can do together, uh, symbiotically, hopefully, uh, where we can benefit from your logs and you can benefit from our categorization where you don't have to give us everything about you because at the end of the day, people don't like Big Brother watching and that's kind of what we are. All right, um, and I'm going to quickly ramble through this. Um, 
so this is just what our portal look like, looks like for people who are interested. Uh, it gives you a very quick system of uh, tagging traffic and categorizing. You can see at the bottom there, you can block various categories and so on. <coughs> but now, uh, the question a number of people asked me this morning is how do we get this onto the Microtech? Uh, our, our, our portal generates a little script for you. And you can see it doesn't ask for lots of information. It just gives you, uh, we want your serial number just to associate something to the Microtech and what your IP address of the Microtech is because we intercept your DNS. And it spits out a little script for you that you can just import and you can see it runs through a couple of things. It explains what it's doing. And obviously you can hack away at the script if you, script if you like. And it applies this to your Microtech and s creates a VPN to our cloud. You can send us DNS requests, send us NetFlow data, and we can give you lists back of IP addresses to block. So in the case of torrenting, as Andrew mentioned, if you want to block torrents, I just send you an IP address of torrents happening on your network because obviously you can't filter torrents with DNS poisoning. There's no point in even trying um, So because peer-to-peer -peer gets around that. So we block the actual destination as soon as it happens. And then you can see, obviously, that's an example of us blocking you. And I'm not going to go through all that. So the firewalling is very simple. You can see there's one line, and um, it's we block on a, an address list. And you can see for what, this is just an example of one of our clients. You can actually block quite a few IP addresses. In this case, it wasn't that high. Uh, 27,740 destinations blocked. There's a bit of torrenting happening, so we're blocking that destination. You can see I ran the query again. All of a sudden, it went up to 873, uh, 27,873. And the larger routers can handle up to about 100,000. The little HFV lights will die if you do this. Um, but obviously, you can't do that kind of load on them. And then we generate nice dashboards, if you guys uh, like that kind of thing. Uh, it's very useful to spot any anom anomalies. And this is typically where we spot interesting things happening. And if you don't like us, you can run the script again, and it deletes itself off your system. All right. And that's my presentation. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions later on, please do talk to me.